curator, Margaret Wunderlich, is going to tell you all about it. I'm going to read a quick bio about her, and then I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to our curator and our co-curator to, <laughs> uh, to tell you to, to talk more. So Margaret Wunderlich is the Columbus, Ohio Business Development Manager for the global auction house uh, Everything But the House, EBTH. She came to the auction world after almost a decade in the commercial gallery space, where she served as assistant director of the Sherry Gallery. Margaret works actively with museums and art institutions in Central Ohio to fundraise, curate, and connect with the community. She is on the board of the Short North Arts District, where she serves as chair of the Public Art Committee. And she also recently served as a board member and head of curation for local art nonprofit Wild Goose Creative from 2018 to 2022. And uh, Margaret is the uh, very new mother of uh, Charles. Yes. So my co-curator Charles, That's right. who was born the day this exhibition opened. That's right. Oh. So, yeah. Mar Margaret, uh, yeah, Margaret is responsible for a lot of exciting things this spring. Yes. <laughs> uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to you. Margaret. Thank you. Yeah. I'm gonna sit if that works for everybody. Hopefully, everybody can hear me. Um, uh, the 1960s is a really, really broad decade. We are not going to cover everything today. The exhibit does not cover everything. And also, I am not going to claim to be an expert. I was not there in the 1960s. Um, so if you were there and you've got special knowledge, we'll have some time at the end. You can definitely grace us with, um, with what you know. And then also, when we go over, we'll pop over to the exhibit afterwards, and you guys can ask questions and tell stories and whatever you'd like to do. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about a few things. Um, this exhibit is laid out a little bit like a house, and I kind of wanted to make the show a bit of an experience of kind of everyday life and um, just that kind of residential experience of just stepping into the average American's day in the life in the 1960s. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about a few, few significant things that keep it kind of lighthearted. So the 1960s was a decade of rapid, rapid change. I think that's something that really struck me when I took the time to dig into this particular decade. Um, a lot was changing. You had not only the counterculture um, kind of challenging the status quo, of the way things have been done for a long time, a lot of revolutionary shifts in social and political ideas um, that also carried over to music, art, fashion, design. Uh, you also had a massive amount of important advancements in science and technology. Um, I think that um, you know my generation or everyone living over the last 10, 20 years kind of understands what that's like. Um, having come up you know, with the internet when I was a kid, we didn't have the internet, and then by the time I graduated high school, we had cell phones. So it was, a, I think, a very similar amount of change in technology, but um, if you can imagine you know, space travel for the first time kind of seemed like something um, out of a comic book, and I think we're seeing that still today. So... Um, you see that science and technology really affecting the everyday life of the average person, which I think is really interesting, and then also some major, major events in social justice, uh, politics, obviously, and then kind of foster this extreme division. Uh, you see a lot of conflict happening in the 1960s. This is just um, a list of some, not all, of the significant social and political events that happened uh, in the 1960s. Uh, obviously a huge range uh, from international relations issues, uh, stuff happening just within our country, uh, racial justice, um, social justice, uh, health um, related things, technology related things, the space race, um, Woodstock, major cultural kind of events. So it's pretty dense uh, group of, of happenings. 
And something that was at least a theme for me, like I mentioned, was just kind of comparing the 1960s to today. Um, so I was kind of thinking back about what are the most significant events of the last 10 years, you know, or the 2010s, with the, obviously the pandemic is a massive event, um, you know, something like 9-11. So I'm always kind of thinking about comparisons to today and um, how to draw those similarities. But this was a, a pretty dense amount of, of things that happened in this decade. Uh, these things, again, all are really affecting the everyday life of your average American. So with the technological and scientific uh, upgrades, you see that in your everyday life, if you're living in the 1960s, the oral contraceptive pill is becoming widely distributed. ATMs are becoming a part of people's everyday lives. It's kind of funny to think about a time before ATMs, but uh, lots of things in uh, like entertainment, like the color TV, the Etch a Sketch, um, the Ford Mustang was uh, released in the 1960s. Kitchen gadgets. This was like the prime time for your small kitchen appliances, the 1960s. Uh, the side-by-side -side refrigerator became very popular. Um, the little toaster oven, the milkshake maker, the blender. Um, before this, you didn't have all this kitchen clutter. Now, it's clutter central in your kitchen. We can thank the 1960s for that. And we still have that today. How many of you guys have, like, the Keurig, and then, like, the other coffee maker, and then... Your toaster oven and your regular toaster and your air fryer, your pressure cooker, your Instapot. Toaster oven. That's pretty cool. I like Do you have one? These um, inventions were actually developed in the 1960s but weren't popularized until later and I thought this was really fascinating that they got their start in the 1960s. LEDs, uh, the computer mouse. And along with that, the precursor to the internet, um, like an operating system, was, was also developed in the 1960s. It's pretty wild. Um, cassette tapes, audio cassette tapes. The self-cleaning oven, which I think is kind of a scam. Does it really clean your oven? No, it does not. Um, but I guess they were developed, but they were just so expensive in the 1960s that no one really had them until the technology got cheaper later down the road. The cordless drill, how did we ever live without that? Um, the video game console, the first video game console was created in the 60s. Um, weather satellites, the first weather satellite was launched in the 1960s. Um, that's pretty significant and how many times do you check the weather on your phone every day? I know I check it a lot. We had the 60s to thank for that. RAM memory, Kevlar. <laughs> Um, and lasers, which um, has so many uses, medical uses, all different types of things we use lasers for, so it's pretty incredible. Art and design, this is the fun stuff. Um, the 1960s had um, a, a trend of really becoming more informal and more bold, experimental. <laughs> um, all types of art and design were drawing influence from psychedelic and free love culture, the space age futurism that comes along with this space travel phenomenon and obsession, um, international aesthetics, so drawing influences from different countries uh, was definitely very popular, and then this growing consumerism, um, which we'll talk a little bit more about man-made materials, but you are getting a lot more man-made materials being used, mold-blown plastics. So this, this ramp up to consumerism is happening. Not anything to hold a candle to what we experience today, but we're starting to see the uptick in that. Um, very much an unconventional avant-garde mentality of the new generation that's shaping these new directions in art and design. So these new materials, like I mentioned, plastics, fiberglass, acrylic, synthetic fabrics, we're getting mass production now. Um, before, everything was, you know, made a lot slower, made from more natural materials. It was more expensive to create things. 
um, more expensive materials and you kind of saved up, you bought your item, that item lasted you a long time, it was significant. Um, now we're getting a little bit more disposable with our items, with our fashion, all types of things. So you're seeing uh, furniture, decor, fashion that is more bold, experimental, and disposable. I've got the egg chair up there. It was de um, developed in the 1960s, designed in the 1960s. Lava lamps, uh, which were also popular when I was growing up in the 90s, so love to see those. Go-go boots, with I know, I know Judith's, are, Judith's favorite boots. Um, we've got bell bottoms, um, a Barbie, uh, really taking a, a huge significance in the 1960s, and kind of plastic mass-produced toys. Um, there's the bubble chair. I thought that was really cool. I've I've sold a few of those at my auction house job, and those are pretty pretty fun. Um, I pulled a few things from the exhibition as well. We've got the mushroom lamp again, that mold blown plastic. Um, the Tedeschi puzzle, which uh, was an example of uh, avant-garde art design in everyday life, mass-produced. This was an artist that designed this puzzle as part of a museum collaboration, and then it was mass-produced and sold everywhere. So you're seeing that kind of art for everyone mentality happening. Um, and then there's some furniture in the exhibition as well that's engineered wood. You weren't seeing that too much before the 1960s. Now, of course, IKEA, we see it every day. I do want to talk about a couple of specific movements that are part of this exhibition, um, one being the Danish modern style. So there's mid-century modern furniture, which is kind of more wide encompassing. You're going to see like straight legs, some more straight lines that kind of mod aesthetic. Um, but within that is a subset specifically Danish modern. And it is um, a very tranquil style. It's meant to be very minimalistic, very practical. Um, it's supposed to really streamline um, your visual experience. So here's a few photos uh, from the exhibition of the Danish modern style. It was originated in Denmark. It technically started, I guess, in the 1940s. I mean, you will see examples of this earlier. Uh, but very much popular in the 50s and the 60s, and still popular today. I mean, how many of you have a piece of Danish modern furniture in your house? Uh, but it's one of the pieces that I look for when I go into estates because it sells very well. Um, originated in Denmark, very heavily influenced from Japanese design concepts, and it definitely emphasizes utility, practicality, again, that very streamlined aesthetic. It's meant to be very easy on your brain and your eyes to have in this space. You are not supposed to be using energy to consume visually or tactilely this furniture or whatever item it is. It doesn't have to be furniture. Um, that Danish modern design is in lots of different things. We've got in the exhibition um, a clock that falls into that aesthetic. We've got some dance dinnerware and cookware that definitely is Danish modern. So. It's a style that goes beyond just furniture. But you do see the furniture being very durable. Um, and again, that's why you're seeing it still around today because it's built well. It's built with usually a hard, solid wood. And it's been popular for a long time. It's a very, very easy style to live with on purpose. Op art is another um, kind of buzzword for the 1960s. So these are a few pieces of op art that you'll see in the exhibition. Um, so this movement kind of got its start in the 1950s when these artists were studying under renowned colorist uh, Joseph Albers uh, at Yale University. Now obviously artists from this movement were from all over the, uh, the world, so not everybody from op art studied at Yale, but a lot of, a lot of major artists did and they would come from all over to study with him. So his students are in the 1960s, early 1960s, kind of in their late 20s, early 30s. They're young artists, but they're working, and they're gaining a lot of traction. Um, 
Julian Stanchek is one of them, heavily featured in the show, and he had a 1964 exhibition in New York titled Optical Paintings, and that is widely accepted as the origin of that op art or optical art terminology. A year later, MoMA did an exhibition. They kind of took all of these artists working in this style, um, put them in one exhibition called The Responsive Eye, and that kind of solidified the op art movement as this big global trend. And you will see it permeate more than just the contemporary art realm. You see it in fashion, you see it in art and design. It was very, very invasive in the culture and just aesthetics of the entire decade. It really takes geometry, color, let's go back to these, line, um, light in some cases, that's a three-dimensional piece on the far right, and uh, it bends your perception. It's all about the perception of the viewer uh, and the art itself. So as you move around the piece, your perception is going to change, the piece is going to change a little bit. As you continue to look at it, even standing in one spot, it's going to kind of bend and move and shift and maybe have this hypnotic effect. Um, there's definitely these artists were playing with the boundaries of color theory, of line and geometry, and what they could do to make different um, relationships between the viewer and the painting. It's kind of ex an experience, very experiential concept in art. So these are just a few comparisons. I think this is one of the most fun things to do in the exhibit. Have uh, go through it with a multi generational group and have people talk about what was different and what was similar to when they were growing up versus the experience of the 1960s. I know I definitely did this while I was researching and putting this exhibition together. So, in this show, we've got a coll this collection of uh, the Reader's Digest condensed books, which were very popular in the 60s, and you could mail away and get them. Um, and I, when I first saw these, I thought, oh my gosh, we had those. They were called Cliff Notes. <laughs> and we were, you know, had them in high school. And um, I just heard the other day about um, a new version of this where there's condensed audio books that you can listen to. Like, it's kind of like turns your favorite novel into a podcast, essentially. And it's a short audio book. You can listen to the whole book. Um, so this concept still lives on even though uh, it looks a little different now. There were uh, what was called premiums, where you would get pieces of dinnerware or cookware for free with purchase of something else. Um, like here, this is dish soap, detergent, or with an oil change, or with you know whatever purchase or service you were getting, they would kind of incentivize people to do that by giving them a free piece of dinnerware. Um, and you could collect the whole set by doing this. Uh, so one thing in my line of work is they're very prevalent, these 1960s pieces of dinnerware that were collected this way, so they aren't worth anything now because they're, they're all over the place. But they're kind of fun, um, and it makes me think of the free spoons and bowls you get in cereal boxes when I was growing up, or the McDonald's toys. Um, again, this is a concept that we're still seeing today, this free gift with purchase, this collectible item that you can, uh, you know, collect them all. Maybe the McDonald's Monopoly would fall into this category as well, but but it's fun. Unfortunately, it, it means that they're kind of worthless items. They're not worth anything. People are always trying to sell their McDonald's toys with me, <laughs> with me at the auction house, and sadly, they're not worth anything, but fun concept, especially as a kid. Op art. Um, this is a painting from 1964 by Bridget Riley, not in the exhibition, um, but I'm seeing a lot of similarities personally to um, art like this piece by Jeff Koons. Um, the Columbus Museum of Art has uh, one of these in their collection. It's pretty much always out if you want to go see it in person, but it's called Equilibrium and it's a basketball balancing perfectly in a tank of water right in the center. Um, so I don't know, it's kind of this optical illusion. I'm just seeing a lot of similarities. It's kind of hard to put your finger on, but it, it's something that you look at and you're like, whoa, am I, am I seeing this right? And you gotta kind of walk around it. And 
Um, it's very experiential, kind of conceptual, um, and definitely bends your perception and gives this hypnotic effect. I think contemporary art's still doing that. Here's the uh, paper dress from the 1960s. This was a dress that you got in like a box of items that was literally like a disposable paper dress and it was kind of made I think by like a feminine products um, company as kind of this gimmick but it got so popular that uh, people just started making more and more fashion items like this very disposable very bold again starting that fast fashion movement and now we have places like Shein where you can get essentially today's version of the paper dress um, very cheap, uh, basically manufactured pieces um, that are kind of disposable, definitely aren't going to last you a lifetime, um, and they're, they kind of capitalize on the trends of today. Probably going to be out of style in a couple years, right? Here is um, furniture. You're seeing a little bit less color today than you did maybe back in the 60s, uh, but that Danish modern or mid-century modern style is still around. Um, and everywhere you go, uh, you can see this uh, mid-century modern style. And I don't know how many of you guys came to the barware festival last weekend, the bottoms up, the mid-century barware very much in style right now, selling very well on the auction market. Um, people love mid-century modern style in all items, furniture, decor, barware. So we're moving into a couple things now that are really different um, from the 1960s to now. Music, I think, is a huge one. Um, the experience of music back in the 1960s is the first decade where the album became very significant. Before that, music was very singles oriented. A single would come out and that's how you consumed music. But in the 60s, it started to be more about the album. Artists were creating a conceptual piece that can had lots of songs all along the same line. Um, the Beatles, Sgt. Pepper's, Lonely Hearts Club Band is a great example of this. Uh, an, an album that kind of touched on one concept throughout all of the songs. Um, and so you would get an album, it was a social experience, you would sit around uh, the record player with your friends and listen to the album. It was an activity, it was a social activity. Um, today, I think we consume music in a very isolated way for the most part, other than concerts. Um, which, you know, kind of got those big festivals, got their start in the 1960s. Um, we have a Woodstock attendee here in the audience, so you guys can ask your questions later about that. Um, spoiler, it wasn't me. Uh, and so now I just feel like when I listen to music, it's in my car by myself. It's in my uh, headphones. Um, it's a very isolated experience now. I've never... I mean, even when I was younger and it was CDs, you bought the CD and you listened to it in your bedroom. Like, it wasn't a, an, a social experience where you'd all get together with your friends, pull your money, buy the album, and go listen to it at a friend's house, and that was your activity. It's just a lot more isolated now. I, I had a Walkman, you know, for all through middle school and high school, and that's how I listened to my music. Sometimes we'd break the headphones apart and you would share it with somebody else, but... Um, just a really different experience, the way we consume music now, which I think is interesting. Probably has a lot of social consequences, I would assume. Technology obviously is very different. Um, we've got some uh, design sketches in the exhibition from the Toledo Scale Company, which uh, showed kind of the mock-up production design of certain products um, and nowadays we that looks very different we do everything with 3d modeling um, you know you can design any product from cars to you know scales to anything it's designed on the computer first and then is manufactured um, you used to have to draw that all out by hand extreme precision um, beautiful artistry the drawings are gorgeous um, I think they're they're really beautiful 
you would never really think that about a three-dimensional mock-up, you know, it doesn't have that same artistry, although the skill involved is the same, it's just a really interesting dichotomy. And that is all I have for you guys today. Well, thank you.